Welcome to the Haunted Half Moon Inn. Tales from the Half Moon Inn presents Scary Stories, The Spooky Squad, written and performed by Tony Capobianco. The Haunted Half Moon Inn has many stories to tell. Many people have experienced very terrifying paranormal phenomena here. Tonight, I'm going to share two true ghost stories with you. Both stories are 100% true. Now, you may be wondering how I know that they are true stories. I know because the first story happened to me, and the second story happened to my parents. This is my story. Around 20 years ago, teenage curiosity lured me into an unforgettable encounter with the realm of the diabolic. One day, before a varsity football game in high school, I picked up my best friend Matt, who lived in the town of Junction Ridge at the time. We weren't expecting much to happen. It's daytime and we won't be going inside the house because people live there. We'll only be there in broad daylight on the side of the road, safely outside of the house, for about a few minutes. What could possibly happen? Now. When I say people were living there, keep in mind that they chose to live only in one section of the large, white, colonial farmhouse. A small addition was added to the original structure after my dad and his family had moved out. That small addition is precisely where each of the next three families decided to quarantine themselves. We know that each family primarily lived in the tiny, newer part because every single time my dad or I would drive by the house at nighttime over a period of 30 years, the lights would only be on in the new addition portion while the main part of the old house was completely dark. No lights from a TV flickering, no light for reading, nothing, only darkness. A few of the people that lived there after my dad's family left attempted renovations on the old part of the house. Without fail, each and every attempt ceased just as quickly as it had begun. The end result is that the house looks every bit its old age, growing more and more dilapidated. A little more backstory on the house. My dad had found out some facts from the town historian, Mr. Sly who used to teach history at the local school. Mr. Sly had told my father that the old farmhouse was built in the late 1700s, and at one time it was also known as the Half Moon Inn. The Half Moon Inn served as a stopover for people traveling from New York City to the upstate. Now, back to the encounter Matt and I had with the Preternatural. We arrive at the ominous old farmhouse on Junction Ridge Road. We are in my parents' 1990 white Jeep Cherokee Pioneer. I park the car and turn off the engine. We are sitting in the Jeep for a few minutes just watching the house. Suddenly, a cold chill runs through my bones as the atmosphere changes. I look nervously at Matt and ask, Hey, do you feel that? The very thick, heavy, and oppressive air? Yeah, man, I feel it, replied Matt. It's as if he's read my mind. The air is similar to the thickness of a day with 100% humidity, except instead of moisture filling the atmosphere, every negative human feeling has taken the water's place. It's difficult to properly convey the experience. It seems unnatural. I'd have to say that the atmosphere is best described simply as unadulterated evil. Perhaps this is but a foretaste of what damned souls experience for eternity in hell. Somehow, I just know that we are in the presence of something inhuman, something evil, something that desires to scare and harm us. While I'm not seeing any otherworldly form, every fiber of my being is absolutely certain that we are not alone. Suddenly, without warning, my engine attempts to turn over. 
It's the sound that an engine makes when a car won't start on a bitterly cold day. The engine is rapidly turning on and off while producing a clicking sound, but the car does not start. Matt and I quickly shoot bewildered and frightened looks at each other. The hair on the back of my neck stands up as if it would like to run away from this place. My hands are nowhere near the keys in the ignition, and the hands of Matt, who is sitting right beside me in the passenger seat, are nowhere near the ignition either. I realize that the engine had just tried and failed to turn itself on. It sputtered as it tried to start, and it did so without the aid of any human hand turning the keys in the ignition. The year is 1997, and this car doesn't have keyless ignition or a remote starter. We look at each other and quickly shout, What the hell was that? Let's get out of here! My heart is racing, and I quickly reach for the keys which have been firmly sitting in the ignition the whole time. A rush of adrenaline pulses through me as I turn the key and hear the car start up. I put the car in drive, heavily press the gas pedal, and get the hell out of there. As I'm driving, I think to myself that not even the Flash could have gotten out of there faster. I take a deep breath and take comfort in knowing that we're now driving straight to the high school to get ready for our football game tonight. After I had time to settle my nerves and collect my thoughts, it dawned on me that my parents had a similar frightening encounter at the old haunted farmhouse. My dad would periodically check in on his old farmhouse over the years. After all, the farmhouse was only down the road from where he lived at the time, so going there didn't require any planning. In fact, even after my parents got married and built a home of their own, the farmhouse was still only several miles away. My dad and I had walked from our house to the old farmhouse and back again on several occasions. I really cherished those walks with my dad. One could say that the farmhouse was never far away, not physically nor mentally. I suppose that my dad periodically checked in on the old farmhouse because doing so was the sort of way that one keeps tabs on an old foe, or perhaps it was a fascination with the unknown and a way to reaffirm that the extraordinary events that he suffered did indeed happen. If he could see the house, then he could see that it wasn't a dream, or to be more precise, that it wasn't a nightmare. It may be a way to confirm that what seems unreal is indeed real, very real. The house is real. My dad's memories are real. The events that happened there are real. Traumatic, but real. So, perhaps these were the reasons that my dad would go past that old house from time to time over the years. Or perhaps the farmhouse called out to him as the sirens of Greek mythology beckoned sailors to their doom. Whatever the case may be, on one Friday evening, when my dad drove my mom past the old haunted farmhouse, they both had a haunting experience. The following story took place before my mom and dad were married. They would frequently go out for a drive in the car, as young couples in love often do. This particular drive was different, very different. It was a warm summer evening in the beautiful Hudson Valley of New York, and my parents went for a spin in my dad's white Pontiac Bonneville. It was a convertible with a red interior. My dad decided to drive by his old farmhouse to check in on it. My mom was not pleased, to say the least. She didn't want to go for two reasons, both of which were very reasonable. Jimmy, I don't want to go there. I don't want to disturb the family that lives there now. They might think that we're some kind of freaky stalkers. Besides, the place is haunted by evil spirits. What if they do something? What if they remember you and follow us back to our homes? 
<laughs> You're so sweet and innocent, but don't be a scaredy cat, said my dad with a gleam in his eyes and an impish smile and laugh. That's enough. Let's go. Please come on. Let's go. Just let it alone. The more that my mom insisted that they leave, the more that my dad seemed determined to stay even longer. After what felt like an eternity to my mom, my dad finally decided to go. So my dad went to start the car. The only problem was that the Bonneville wouldn't start. He turned the key again, but once again, nothing. The engine didn't try to turn over. The only sound was silence. After several tries, my dad popped the hood and got out of the car to take a look. Returning to the car, he told my mom what the problem was. A wire was pulled out of the engine while we were sitting here, he said. Couldn't the wire just have loosened and fallen out? No, this wire didn't loosen and it didn't simply fall out. This could only have happened if someone physically pulled the wire up. This was no accident said my dad, in a serious but restrained tone. He showed no signs of being afraid. My mom, however, was very scared. After learning about why the car wouldn't start, my mom went from having been very nervous to very scared in just a moment. My dad put the wire in its correct place, and he was finally able to start the car. They then left the haunted farmhouse, the old Half Moon Inn, and drove into the night. A night that would never be forgotten. My dad's stories of his time at the old farmhouse are far more terrifying than my encounter with the evil spirits. His true tales could fill an entire book. I can't imagine what it was like for him to live in that haunted farmhouse for several years as a boy. It must have been traumatic. It almost certainly left a lifelong mark on him and his brothers. After living there, they would never see the world the same way again. They would never doubt the existence of spiritual beings or whether or not there is life after death. They would never see such things in the way that those who haven't been harassed by evil spirits do. The paranormal experiences that they had in that house are far more frightening than any TV show or movie. Please keep in mind that these frightening paranormal experiences that I've shared with you here today happened when we were merely near the property outside of the old farmhouse. Imagine what has happened and can still happen inside of this haunted house. It was my dad's encounters with the preternatural, along with my own, that set me on a quest to find the truth about the unseen world. This is the inspiration for the Haunted Half Moon Inn YouTube channel. Welcome to the Haunted Half Moon Inn. This story is inspired by true events. Perhaps the fictional elements in this story are true events that just haven't happened yet. Tales from the Half Moon Inn, Part 2 The banging on the wall had ended. My heart, however, switched from a calm, steady beat to a thunderous pounding. Can a seventeen-year-old have a heart attack? The fight-or-flight instinct screamed into action as my mind tried to process what had happened. The atmosphere of the room was thick, oppressive, and charged with fear. Bro, what the crap was that? Dan asked as he stood up from his chair. I... I... don't know. Maybe the stories are all true, I shakily replied while I tightly grasped the chair that I was sitting on. Did that just happen? Is this real life right now? Was that a ghost? Christina questioned with fear in her eyes. It wasn't a ghost. Calm down. Take a breath and think about it. I'm sure there is a perfectly rational explanation for all of this, Felicity replied as her eyes panned around the room. What was it then? Christina sincerely questioned. Maybe it was bad pipes. That part of the house is old. 
Plumbing can cause all kinds of weird and loud sounds, responded Felicity with a satisfied smile. Maybe someone broke into the house. Maybe it's a burglar or some deranged escaped mental patient, said Dan while looking at Felicity. There's only one way to find out. Let's go take a look. Let's see if anyone is there. There's four of us, and we'll grab some weapons just in case, I said as I rose from my chair. Okay, John Wick, what weapons? asked Christina as she rolled her eyes. We're in the dining room, so I'm pretty sure that we'll find some knives in the kitchen. Felicity, do you have a bat? I responded. Heck yeah, I do. I play softball, Felicity happily remarked. Wait, are you guys, like, serious right now? We just heard footsteps, followed by banging on the wall. We're the only ones in the house. Two of the three possibilities that we came up with include a ghost and an escaped maniac. So obviously you think it's a good idea to go check it out. Are you guys all mental? said Christina in an agitated tone. Chris, Chris, relax. I'm here. I'll bring the pain if some psycho is here, confidently said Dan as he put his left arm around Christina. I grabbed two knives from the kitchen. I gave one knife to Dan, and I kept the other. Felicity went to the closet to get her bat. She then walked over to the door that leads to the older, original section of the house. Alarm off, said the home security system after Felicity had turned it off. If the security alarm was armed... How could anyone have gotten in? questioned Christina. Someone could have come in when the alarm was off earlier in the day, answered Felicity as she reached for the doorknob. Felicity opened the door and I went through it first. I reached for and found a light switch, but it didn't work. Darkness surrounded me. Using a voice command, I quickly turned on my phone's flashlight. As I shined the light around the room, I didn't see any intruder there. Felicity, why don't the lights work in this room? I asked as I continued to look around what seemed to be another kitchen. Oh yeah, sorry about that. We have to call an electrician to see what's wrong with the lighting over here, answered Felicity as she slowly walked behind me. Okay, the kitchen and dining room are clear, I announced as I walked towards another door. What room is behind this door? I asked Felicity while shining my flashlight on the doorknob. That's a living room and a staircase that leads upstairs to bedrooms and a bathroom, answered Felicity as she clung to the softball bat in her hands. Does anyone think it's weird that there are two kitchens that are literally right next to each other? Christina questioned as she firmly held Dan's hand. Yeah, what's up with that? asked Dan as he directed his eyes towards Felicity. Don't look at me. I didn't design this place. Felicity responded. It's kind of like someone built a new kitchen in order to completely stay away from the original kitchen and the original house. It's almost as if someone was afraid of this house, I remarked as I opened the door to the living room. (coughs) The unsettling atmosphere that I had been sensing since I arrived in this house grew ever more unsettling. Dread crept into my pores. Sorrow slithered into my heart. A frantic fear lurched towards me with every breath I took. What's going on here? Is this what real evil feels like? Is my mind playing tricks on me? What if we're not alone? Is there an intruder here? What if he has a gun? What if the banging came from a ghost? My mind raced with unpleasant questions and possible scenarios. Something lightly touched my hair. My nerves slightly increased as I raised my right hand to investigate what creepily touched the hair on my head. It was a spider web. The light from my flashlight revealed that cobwebs were abundant in this old living room. Although it was apparent that no one had lived in this living room for a number of years, spiders had certainly made themselves at home here. The monster's house was charming in comparison. The walls were coated with an old and chipped white paint. A very large and ancient-looking fireplace dominated the room. 
The very old hardwood floors creaked with each step taken, for dusty windows allowed a little moonlight to enter the room. Two of the windows overlooked the front porch, and the other two windows faced the backyard. I pulled on the front windows to make sure that they were locked and secured. Felicity checked the back windows and confirmed that they too were secure. Downstairs is secure. No sign of entry here. The front door and the windows are all locked shut, I said as I walked towards the others. Everything looks to be in order here, said Felicity as she shined her flashlight in my face. We should go check the upstairs too, I suggested. The light from my phone flickered and then turned off. Pressing my phone screen resulted in nothing but a dead black screen. My phone's dead, I told everyone. All right, let me turn my phone's flashlight on too then, offered Christina, who had been walking with Dan. They had been using Dan's phone for a flashlight. It suddenly grew darker as Dan's phone also went dead. Your phone is dead now too, I asked Dan. Yeah, bro. It's weird. This thing's battery was at 90% when we were sitting at the dining room table. It shouldn't have died on me, said a frustrated Dan. Same here. My phone was at 94% before we left the dining room. I had charged it before I came over here, I explained. The ghost hunting shows on TV say that ghosts drain batteries. It's pretty common in all of the shows that I watch added Christina as she tightened her grip on Dan's hand. What? Do they supposedly eat batteries or something? Or wait, maybe they're just low on electrolytes, joked Felicity. Haha, <laughs> well, the thinking is that spirits use the energy from batteries to help them manifest or to interact with our physical plane, Christina gently explained as she rubbed her right ear. Is anyone else cold? I asked as I took a closer look at the fireplace. Yes, said Christina. Yes, yeah, so what? Felicity questioned. I was just wondering. It was fairly warm today and now I'm cold, I replied while placing the back of my hand on Felicity's left cheek. Your hand is cold, Felicity responded in a somewhat surprised tone. Footsteps walking up the stairs put a stop to our conversation. We were only a few feet from the stairs, and we hadn't seen anyone downstairs with us. We had already checked the kitchen, dining room, and the living room. Could someone have been in the house with us? If so, was it a living person or a dead person? The gloomy atmosphere intensified further. Despite being with my three friends, a psychological isolation imprisoned me. Is there anybody here? Dan called out in a virile voice. No one answered back, at least not with a voice. The toilet upstairs flushed. Someone, or something, was up there. The blood drained from my face. Goosebumps rose all over my body. Dan snatched Christina's flashlight from her hand and ran upstairs to confront whoever was there. With Christina's flashlight in his right hand and a kitchen knife in his left hand, he moved with the intensity and agility of a defensive end in pursuit of the quarterback. Felicity, can I borrow... I began to ask when she handed me her flashlight before I could finish the sentence. I climbed up the stairs two steps at a time. Felicity's phone was in my left hand, and the knife was in my right. You good, bro? I asked Dan. Yeah, there's no one in this bathroom, replied Dan in a confused voice. Let's go check the rest of the rooms up here. You open each door as I shine the flashlight into the room, and then we'll do the same with the closet, I instructed Dan. Dan proceeded to open the first bedroom, and I immediately shined my light with my left hand while my right hand was already with the kitchen knife. Although my heart and mind had been racing a few moments prior, they both calmed to a slow, cool state. An icy, cold focus took over. 
I had one objective, to clear and secure the room in front of me. Room by room we cleared the upstairs in this manner. Dan and I walked down the stairs and returned to Christina and Felicity. The girls were hugging each other as they waited in the darkness of the empty living room. I handed Felicity's phone back to her, as Dan likewise handed Christina's phone back to her. What did you find? Felicity asked nervously. Nothing, I calmly answered. But we heard footsteps, and then we heard a toilet flush, Christina said, as she tilted her head, as if doing so would help her to better understand. I heard it too. We all heard it. But I promise you that there is no one in this house with us right now, Dan told Christina in a comforting voice. No living person is in the house, I added in a distant voice. Enoch, please don't start with this again, Felicity said while poking my left arm. Sorry, you're right. I mean, now's not the time, I said as I reached for Felicity's hand. The last hour has been wild. Let's head back to the dining room. My parents should be back with pizza any minute, Felicity calmly mentioned. Felicity led the way back to the newer part of the house where the dining room was. As we walked back through the uninhabited section of the house, the heavy air of the house continued to weigh me down. This unnerving feeling had momentarily left my mind when Dan and I had cleared the upstairs. Maybe I didn't notice it then, because I was so focused on finding a potentially dangerous human threat. Or maybe it was the adrenaline that overrode my senses, so that I didn't note the heavy and unnatural feeling that had stalked me since I arrived here tonight. Whatever the reason, once the human threat had been ruled out, the horrible feeling of dread and gloom returned. We entered back into the new edition of the house. Alarm on. Warning. The smoke detector is not responding. See the keypad for details, spoke the security system when Felicity armed it. Alarm off, spoke the security system as headlights shined through the window of the front door. What now? An alien invasion, I said sarcastically. If it is an alien invasion, I just hope that they brought food, Dan replied with a smirk. Hun, you're always thinking with your stomach, Christina joked with a smile. Just remember that the quickest way to my heart is through my stomach, quipped Dan. Actually, the quickest way to the heart is through the ribcage, I added as I began to relax in the dining room chair. Or maybe, now hear me out, I know this is crazy, but it could be my parents coming home with a boatload of beauteous pizza, Felicity said with a twinkle in her eye. Everyone laughed for several minutes. It was much-needed laughter. It was the kind of laughing fit that teenagers are sometimes prone to. This chuckle fest wasn't caused because our jokes were so great. No, this was a way for us to diffuse the tension and stress that we had all experienced over the past hour. It was a wave of calm relaxation that gleefully carried us away for several minutes. The mix of stress, anxiousness, excitement, and fear instantly transformed into calmness, giddiness, hilarity, and peace. The kitchen door opened as Felicity's parents finally arrived with the highly anticipated pizza. Hello, Mr. and Mrs. Fairfield, we all said with warm excitement. Hey guys, how is everyone tonight? asked Felicity's mother. Better now, quickly answered Christina. That pizza smells delicious, Dan excitedly commented. Dig in, everybody. We have a sausage pie, pepperoni pie, sausage and mushroom, and also a pizza supreme. We feasted upon the absolutely delicious pizza from the Pizza Emperor. I had five slices and Dan had four slices. Christina and Felicity each had three slices of pie. Our appetites had peaked in large part due to the mysterious adventure that we had just concluded. Mr. and Mrs. Fairfield satiated our hunger with this glorious spread of New York's finest pizza. I had told the Fairfields about the glory that is Pizza Emperor. During dinner, we told Felicity's parents about our escapades while they were gone. They listened attentively to our explanation of the night's events, but they didn't seem to be alarmed after they learned that we didn't find any human intruders. They reasoned that we probably heard a combination of mice wonky plumbing, 
and the furnace kicking on. Mr. Fairfield also suggested that our perceptions had likely been influenced by being in a room without functioning lights as well as a powerful dose of fear. He noted that fear can be contagious and that it could cause our imaginations to run amok. Felicity found this all to be very convincing and reasonable. I, on the other hand, was not at all sold by the explanations offered by the Fairfields. I had heard what I had heard, and I had felt what I had felt. The overwhelming sense of being watched, along with the oppressive atmosphere and the phantom footsteps and the self-blushing toilet were all very real phenomena. If those experiences weren't enough, the stories of Mr. C and the abandoned state of the original part of this old house further reaffirmed my suspicions. This house seems to be haunted, very haunted. After dinner, the four of us decided that we ought to meet up at Felicity's house each Friday night to share scary stories. It was the perfect setting for a spooky club. Friday Night Frights was a concept that Felicity came up with. A mixture of concern, uncertainty, and intrigue were my feelings on the idea. Telling each other a mixture of true stories along with fictional stories sounded like a fantastic idea to me. After all, it's an idea that would normally be right up my alley. The thought that this old farmhouse might yet play a role in our Friday nights haunted my mind. The sense that this wasn't over washed over me like a murky fog. The cold, hard rain poured on my umbrella as I briskly walked to my kitchen door. It was a cold and wet Friday in March. The weather that day was quite a contrast to the practically balmy conditions of the previous week. A week had already passed since Enoch, Dan, Christina, and I shared our spooky adventure. Dan didn't know what to make of the events of that night. Enoch and Christina, on the other hand, were convinced that a ghostly presence had caused footsteps, banging, and the upstairs toilet to flush. I loved them both dearly, but I couldn't understand how they could come to such a fantastical conclusion. The sounds had indeed been exciting and frightful, but the unexpected and the unknown always create that kind of physiological response. This house was old, and my family had only been living there since Christmas Eve. Like my dad said, it takes a while to get used to the sounds of a house after moving in. The house may have been new to us, but in reality it was a very old house. In fact, it was a house in need of a lot of TLC. Then add in the fact that while we had been discussing the possibility that it was haunted, we heard those unexpected sounds. Who wouldn't have been on edge? Who wouldn't have wondered if an intruder had gotten in? It's one thing to get caught up in the excitement of the moment, but it's quite another thing to allow that moment to carry you away in a stream of fantasy. No, nothing supernatural had happened. Ghosts weren't a real thing. If such a thing existed in the 21st century, then there would be undeniable evidence. Virtually everyone had a smartphone, so why hadn't an authentic image been captured? The reason is simple. No compelling ghostly image or video exists because phantoms don't exist. Just as our experience had a rational explanation, so too did all of the supposedly ghostly experiences reported by others. The simple, normal, and reasonable explanations are almost always the right explanations. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. I disarmed and then rearmed the home security system as soon as I got inside of the house. It's the kind of activity that becomes a habit. My parents insisted that I always armed the security system whenever I was home alone. I didn't mind doing it because it made me feel safe. I had gym class during 8th period, so I was thirsty as a racehorse. Having put my phone and my backpack on the counter, I turned to the fridge to get some sweet tea. As I downed the big, delicious glass of sweet tea, I went to pick up my phone to check if I had gotten any new messages. 
The problem was that it wasn't there. I was certain that I had put my phone on the kitchen counter. I distinctly remembered placing it there. A teenage girl doesn't simply lose her phone. No way. Where was it? It had to be somewhere close. Maybe I had knocked it off of the counter and onto the floor. I searched for my phone with a laser-like focus. Concern hadn't hit me until my search of the kitchen ended unsuccessfully. It was at that point that I began to become stressed. My phone had all of my pictures, notes, and musings. Although it seemed senseless, I checked the rest of our living area to no avail. It wasn't in the bathroom, living room, kitchen, or dining room. Then I faintly heard the bell sound that my phone makes when it receives a text message. After several more texts came in, I pinpointed where it was coming from. I opened the door to the unused kitchen in the old section of the house, and there it was. My phone was lying on top of the kitchen counter. Absolutely confounded, I snatched up my phone and returned back to our living quarters in the newer part of the house. There had to be a rational explanation for how my phone had gotten into a room that I hadn't been in for a week. My mind must have played a trick on me. Phones don't grow legs and walk away. Yet, if I had opened the door to that unused kitchen in the house and put my phone on the counter and then walked back into our apartment without remembering doing so, then there could be something wrong with my brain. Seventeen is too young to go mental or to have memory loss. The thing was that this wasn't the first time that I had put something down and later found it in a strange place that I didn't remember putting it. It had happened several times over the past week. Three days ago, I had put the TV remote on the living room table only to find it behind the mirror in the bathroom cabinet. Two days before that, I had placed my necklace on the end table in the living room and then found it in the egg drawer in the refrigerator a few days later. Who puts their necklace in the refrigerator? Maybe the nasty fall that I had had about a month ago when I slipped on ice in the mall parking lot had something to do with this. Having had hit my head could have explained my headaches as well as the misplaced objects. I told myself that I would tell my parents if this kept happening. My mom and dad were still under stress due to everything related to the move. Fixing up the old section of the house was an expensive project, and the last thing that I wanted to do was to be the cause of further stress. Mom and Dad had always been the best parents, and I knew that if I mentioned my apparent memory issues to them, that they would spare no expense in getting me medical care. Since I wasn't sure if my experiences with apparently misplacing things was a big deal, I decided to keep it to myself for a while. Thank goodness it was Friday because that meant that the crew would be coming over later that night. It was to be our first official meeting of the Creep Squad. Friday Night Frights was on the menu, and it was the perfect thing to take my mind off of my mind. Checking my phone to see who had texted me earlier, I saw that it was Christina. Christina texted, Hey girl, how are you? Are we still on for tonight? Hey, I'm good, and you can bet your bottom that we are still on for tonight, I texted back to her. I hope that we tell the stories this time instead of becoming the story, Christina texted. Haha, <laughs> I know what you mean. Last Friday night was something else. I responded as I sat down on the couch. So, has Enoch asked you to be his girlfriend yet? Christina questioned. Chrissy, don't push it. We're good friends. There's no rush. If he asks, then he asks. Felicity, tell me something. What will you say if he does ask you? Let Enoch ask first, and then I'll let you know. Christina texted me back. Haha, <laughs> you're so mysterious. I'll see you later. See you soon, I texted back to Christina. I smiled as I put my phone down. Having three good friends so soon after moving to a new school was something that I really appreciated. Enoch, Christina, and Dan made me feel like I belonged. That was no small matter, since it was only a couple of months since I had moved from Charleston, South Carolina to Junction Ridge, New York. My peaceful reflection was short-lived, because out of nowhere the security alarm went off and said, Warning! 
There is something in the house. You are not alone. You are never alone. We are always here. Check the keypad for details. My heart pounded like a drum against my ribcage. A cold chill originated at the bottom of my neck and poured down my spine like an icy waterfall. The blaring alarm was unnerving at any time, but it's infinitely more unnerving when you are home by yourself and it tells you that you aren't alone. I had heard the alarm get triggered in the past, but I had never heard it say those words. Those haunting words. Warning, there is something in the house. You are not alone. You are never alone. We are always here. What security system is programmed to say that? It didn't make any sense. Alarms are supposed to warn of a sensor being triggered. It's supposed to indicate if a window or door has been opened, or if the window glass has been shattered. Alarm systems aren't supposed to do what this one had done. Was it my brain? Was I really losing it? The Unsolved Mysteries theme song played on my phone. It was my ringtone. The dispatch center was on the line. I picked up my phone. It looks like an alarm was triggered at your house. Are you okay? Do you want us to send an officer over? The dispatcher asked. Yes, the alarm is going off. I don't know what's going on. Please send someone over to check it out. Fear grasped me as I grabbed my softball bat and waited on our front porch for the officer to arrive. I watched the rain. Although my body was trembling, I was ready to act. My heart was still pounding, but it was pounding a bit softer now that I had a softball bat and knew that the police were on the way. If there was someone in the house, the cops would find them, and they would determine where they got in. After what seemed like an eternity, the police siren grew closer and closer. It went from a distant echo to a blaring howl. I had never expected the sound of police sirens to give me comfort, but on that day it brought me joyous relief. The strobing lights of the police car were like a warm blanket over my trembling body as the car pulled into my driveway. Ma'am, are you all right? I'm Officer Brody from the Junction Ridge Sheriff's Department. Please turn off the alarm and then wait here while I take a look inside the house. Okay. Thank you, officer. My name is Felicity Fairfield. While Officer Brody searched the house, I texted my parents to let them know what was going on. My dad told me that he'd be home in about 20 minutes. My mom said that she'd be home in about half an hour. After about 15 minutes, Officer Brody returned with an uneasy and slightly pale look on his face. Felicity, I didn't find any evidence of forced entry or of an intruder. All of the windows and doors were locked and secured, but... But what, officer? Well, I don't know a good way to say it, so I'll just say it. I had a weird feeling while I searched the old part of the house that looks like no one is living in it, said Officer Brody in a conflicted tone. Officer Brody's face became more pale as he said. I heard footsteps going up the stairs as well. I also thought that I had heard the faucet running in the upstairs bathroom. I would have been done checking the house about five minutes earlier, but I really wanted to double and triple check the house because of what I heard. Thanks for securing the house, Officer Brody. What could have caused the alarm to tell me those strange things? What triggered the alarm in the first place? I can't be sure. Like I said, I didn't find anything that triggered the alarm. I would call the security company and ask them about it. If your alarm is connected to Wi-Fi and your mobile devices, then it might be possible for someone to hack the system. That might explain both the trigger and the strange vocal warning, Officer Brody explained. That makes sense, and it sounds scary. We will call the security company to find out what we should do. Officer Brody then added, If possible, it might be a good idea to prevent the alarm from being able to connect to mobile devices. If that can't be done, then I'd look into replacing it with an alarm that can't connect to anything besides the dispatch center. Thanks again, Officer Brody. I really appreciate everything that you did. No problem. That's what we're here for. If you have any other problems, we'll be here. Take care, ma'am. Officer Brody walked off of the porch and spoke to my father who had pulled into the driveway moments ago. 
Was the alarm malfunctioning? Was it hacked? Was I losing my mind? I didn't know the answers. If nothing else, I gained a story to tell the Spooky Squad. Felicity stoked the fire in the living room fireplace of the old part of her house. A thunderstorm roared outside. At 62 degrees outside, it was just warm enough for a thunderstorm to form, and just cool enough to utilize the aged fireplace. Although this original section of the old house was still in need of a lot of renovation before anyone could live in it, the living room offered the perfect setting for the spooky squad. It gave us some privacy away from the confined apartment area of the addition to the original house where Felicity and her family lived. Felicity, Dan, Christina, and I were excited to launch what we hoped would become a weekly tradition. Friday Night Frights with the Spooky Squad offered us the chance to forget about our stresses for a time. Telling true and fictional scary stories was something that we had all been looking forward to since we came up with the idea last week. Sharing ghost stories and horror stories is always fun, but is there anything cooler than telling them in a real-life haunted house. Felicity kicked off the first official gathering of the Spooky Squad by telling us all about the fearful afternoon that she had before we all came over. We sat around the fireplace as Felicity told us about how she lost her phone only to find it in the unused kitchen in the original section of the house. Goosebumps activated when she described how her home security system went off and told her that she wasn't alone. Something was in the house, and that something was always there. We were all transfixed as she recounted her mysterious and frightening experience. Although Felicity explained that the alarm was probably triggered by a malfunction or by some mischievous hacker pulling a prank, I was increasingly becoming more convinced that the house was haunted. Very haunted. Sitting on the love seat with Dan, Christina began to share a creepy experience that she had freshman year. Amanda, Misty, and I were having a sleepover at Bridget's house. Misty asked if we had heard about the light as a feather game. We shrugged and asked what it was. Misty explained that it was easy to do and that she demonstrated for us. She asked me to lay down on the floor. Then Misty barely touched me with her fingertips on the left side and Bridget and Amanda did the same on my right side. We all closed our eyes as they began to repeatedly chant, light as a feather, stiff as a board. Light as a feather, stiff as a board. After about five minutes, I felt myself gently rising above the floor. I couldn't believe it, but I must have been six inches off of the floor. I had amazingly been lifted off of the floor by their fingertips. Are you serious? Felicity questioned while squinting. For real, it was crazy. We were both excited and creeped out answered Christina as her hair fell over her eyes as she nodded her head. Magic or levitation or what? I asked. Yes, responded Christina with a laugh. Speaking of magic, said Dan as he leaned forward towards the fire. Last fall I went to a party out in the woods of Junction Ridge. It was a secluded spot off of Old Black Horse Road. Billy Scott's older brother got a pony keg for the party. A bunch of people from school were there. It had gotten to be pretty late, and me and Billy wandered off to explore a bit. I'm not sure how far or long we walked, but it was far enough for the voices from the party to sound faded. Shining my flashlight, I was struck by the appearance of a huge, gnarly old oak tree. It had a creepy vibe to it. It must have been hundreds of years old. Then, a few feet in front of the tree, I saw that someone had painted a pentagram in red. 
a rotted tree stump appeared to have been fashioned into some kind of satanic altar. Animal bones littered the area around it. The skeletons looked like they belonged to cats and dogs. We heard footsteps in the autumn leaves. We called out, but nobody responded. I don't know if someone was watching us or if an animal was doing its thing, but we didn't stick around long. Whatever went on there was sick and totally messed up. What in the world? Satanists that sacrifice pets? Is Junction Ridge really that messed up? Felicity asked as her face had become strained. Junction Ridge, despite its quaint rustic charm, seems to have a darkness about it, Dan answered as he took a sip of coffee. Well, to be fair, every town has a mix of good and bad, Christina remarked while smiling at Felicity. The upstairs toilet flushed. <laughs> Felicity went upstairs to see if anyone was in the bathroom. Yet again, there was no one upstairs, and the toilet had flushed of its own accord. Christina grabbed Dan's arm, and my eyes grew large as I looked into the fire. After Felicity came back downstairs, I shared the following story with the Spooky Squad. I've heard that a witch lives here in Junction Ridge. One night after midnight, a woman wearing a long black dress was seen floating a foot off of the pavement as she went down Hilltop Road. Get out of here. A witch floating down the road? That's totally ridiculous, said Felicity. I'm neither confirming nor denying the story. I'm just telling you what people say, I said as I shrugged my shoulders. My mom's friend got out of work one night, and on her way home she had to pull over to the side of the road because she had had a flat tire. Now, this was the early 1990s, so people didn't have cell phones yet. If you had a flat tire, you had to fix it yourself, start walking towards a gas station, or wait for someone to stop and help you, Felicity explained. My mom's friend was in luck. As she was checking her tires, a police officer happened to have been passing by, and he stopped to help her. The policeman was very nice and changed her tire for her. He asked my mom's friend if she knew how she had gotten the flat tire. She told him that she had no idea. The policeman then told her that the tire had clearly been stabbed with a knife. Ordinarily, this kind of thing is the work of teenage pranksters and vandals. Maybe that's all it was in this case. Then again, this wasn't an ordinary time in the low country of South Carolina. You see, in the 80s and 90s, a lot of young women were going missing in coastal South Carolina. More than a few mutilated corpses were turning up in the coastal marshes. Tragically, these dead bodies often belonged to girls who had been reported missing. These poor, innocent murder victims had some things in common. They were all between 16 and 30 years old, thin, pretty, and had black hair. These young girls were sexually assaulted and brutally murdered, and not necessarily in that order. This was the wicked work of a particularly sadistic serial killer. This psychopath stalked the knights in the low country looking for innocent girls to become his prey. He was dubbed the Low Country Butcher. A beautiful young girl with silky shoulder-length black hair worked at a video rental store in the suburbs of Charleston. Her name was Stacy, and her shift was usually 3 p.m. till close at 11 p.m. On a hot and humid summer night in late June, she locked up the store and walked towards her car. While approaching the driver's side door, she called out, Dang it, I forgot my umbrella in the store. Stacy quickly returned to the store and disappeared into the back office. 
A few minutes later, with her umbrella in hand, she returned to her car. The feeling of being watched crept over her. It was nighttime, and the fact that there was a notorious serial killer on the loose had all the young women of the coastal Carolinas on edge. Stacy got into her car and headed towards her apartment as she normally did after finishing work. The car began to pull to the side, and she could hear the tire making an unpleasant and undesired sound. It was obvious that she had a flat tire and she had to pull over to the side of the road. This stretch of road was dark and surrounded by a forest. She got out of the car and confirmed that it was a flat tire. Stranded on the side of the road and surrounded by darkness and the wilderness, she was isolated. A young woman never wants to be in this position. With no phone, there's no way to call for help. She was apparently on her own. Bright headlights appeared and a car slowed down to a crawl and then stopped about five yards from the bumper of her car. Two black boots stepped out of the car. A tall, slim, strange man slowly walked towards her and said, Looks like you're having car troubles. Let me give you a hand. Okay, thanks. That would be great, replied Stacy as she nervously stood by her car. Do you have a spare tire in your trunk? The man asked as he walked closer. I think so. Let me check, Stacy replied as she unlatched the trunk from inside the car. The stranger crept towards her as she opened her trunk. He now had a large knife in his right hand. This stranger was the low country butcher, and he was on the prowl. Stacy was his intended prey. She was in grave danger. The psychotic butcher commanded her to stay still so he could tie her hands up. Freeze! Put your knife down, now! Stacy yelled as she drew her gun on the butcher. The deranged serial killer was shocked. He had gone from being the hunter to being the hunted. As Stacy ordered him to put his knife down, an army of police officers converged on the scene from the woods. Stacy slapped handcuffs on him as the South Carolina police arrested him and threw him in jail. What the butcher didn't know was that Stacy was an undercover policewoman. With the help of a criminal profiler, the police had learned the modus operandi of the low country butcher. They used this knowledge to set up a sting operation to catch him. Stacy went undercover and worked in the video rental store in an area that was in the low country butcher's favored hunting grounds. The butcher couldn't resist the bait. On that fateful night, he stabbed Stacy's tire with his knife and he hid out of sight as he waited for her to drive away so he could follow her. Unbeknownst to him, Stacy checked her tires in an inconspicuous manner every night as she left the store. On that particular evening, she saw that the tire had been punctured. When she went back into the video store, she phoned the chief of police to tell him that it was time to bring this sick bastard down. The police had gotten to the previously chosen part of the road where Stacy would pull over and they waited for the butcher to show up and attempt to begin his assault. It worked. In June of 1996, the low country butcher was finally apprehended and his reign of terror came to a close. The butcher was a fiendish creature of habit. The victims were all his selected type. He'd stalk them for a period of time as he learned their routines, and then he'd stab the back right tire of their car and then proceed to follow them in his car until they pulled over on the side of the road. He always chose to implement his sinister trap in the shadow of night. My mom's friend had black hair. She was thin and beautiful. She was a waitress and routinely got off of work late at night. If that kind police officer had not happened to have been driving by at exactly that moment on that night, would she have been yet another statistic of the low country butcher? Wow, Felicity, that's really scary. The butcher was a real-life monster, I said as I scratched my chin. Yeah, Enoch, he was truly a monster. 
I don't think anyone shed a tear when he received the death penalty. My mom says that everyone was relieved after he was executed in the electric chair, said Felicity as the thunderstorm continued outside. Have you guys heard of the ghoul of Junction Ridge? No, Enoch, what's that? asked Dan. In the early 19th century, there was a series of brutal killings. Folks in the town of Junction Ridge were scared. Mutilated bodies were found in the woods. The dead bodies often had bite marks and chunks of flesh were missing. The people of Junction Ridge weren't sure if the bites were from a man or an animal. If the bite marks did come from a man, it must have been a man with a large and jagged set of teeth. Modern dentistry didn't exist then, so it would not have been peculiar for someone to have had an anomalous set of chompers. Men and women were the victims. Back in the 1800s, nobody had ever heard of the term serial killer. While death wasn't a stranger to the people of that age, a string of murders was unheard of, and the small town was on edge. Was it a bear or a wolf? that had developed a taste for human flesh. Could it have been the work of a Native American tribe? Or was it the skinwalker of Native American legends? Was it a deranged man? Was it some kind of monstrous creature that stalked the woods? Nobody knew the answer. These accounts are still a mystery to this day. Maybe it was a werewolf, bro, Dan said as he rested his right hand on Christina's leg. Have you seen a lot of werewolves here? I asked while looking at Dan. You kind of resemble a werewolf after you haven't shaved for several days. Does silver hurt you when you touch it? Dan asked with a satisfied look. The only thing that hurts is my head when I have to put up with you, pal. Everybody laughed. The laughter was interrupted by the sound of footsteps coming from the upstairs. went upstairs to investigate, and once again, there was no one else up there. There was no obvious explanation for what caused the sound of footsteps. Felicity still thought that the toilet that flushed by itself and the footsteps could all be explained by the fact that the house was old and creaky. On account of the scary experience that Felicity had earlier in the afternoon, when their home security alarm was triggered and said some really bizarre and creepy things, I decided to keep my thoughts on the matter to myself. The heavy, thick, and unnatural feeling of the atmosphere of this house, along with the phantom footsteps, the banging sounds, the faucets that turned themselves on and off, and the toilet that flushed itself, convinced me that we were never alone in this old house. Like the alarm system told her, you are not alone. There is something in the house. You are never alone. We are always here. I hope you enjoyed your stay at the Half Moon Inn. Do come and visit us again. Until then, always remember that just because you don't see them doesn't mean that they aren't there.